both by um, direct command. And kind of what I talked about last time, I was faced with a decision as to whether or not to regard other things in Yahushua's teachings to be commandments, even though they're not really expressly stated as commandments. But because I did not want to, us to miss any of Yahushua's important teachings, simply because it wasn't formally expressed in commandment form, we are going to continue examining his words for precepts and principles to live by, even if they were not expressly stated as commandments. Otherwise, I can kind of see it, you know, there will be some who might just hang a list of Yahshua's commands on the wall and think they've got it covered, when really there's a lot they may miss. And I really don't want to miss anything. I don't want any of us to miss anything, actually. And and so in doing this, we, we may find that um, there might be some things I do miss, um, but it's important for you and all of us to take personal responsibility to examine Yahshua's words in depth. And so I encourage you, don't even see my list as a finalized or authoritative list. Um, but nevertheless, here's what I have so far uh, concerning Yahshua's commandments. Number one, repent. Number two, rejoice in trials and persecutions. Do not think he came to destroy or abolish the law. Be more righteous than the Pharisees. Beware of the danger of anger. Don't make an offering if there is unresolved sin. Do not lust or fantasize about committing any sin in your heart. Put away the old man. Put on the new man. Do not divorce your spouse unless it's proven they are to be, they are proven to be an unbeliever. Let your word alone have integrity without needless swearing. Do not resist an evil person. With proper stewardship in mind, give to those who ask. Love those who do not love you, including our enemies, so that you can be children of Elohim. Don't give charity or pray to please men. Do it to please Yahweh and in pursuit of his rewards. Don't use vain repetitions when praying. Pray in this manner, Yahshua prescribes. When you fast, don't appear unto men to be fasting. Do not live for yourselves treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven. Judge not that you be not judged. Don't be a hypocrite. Remove the major sins from your life before trying to confront someone about minor sins in theirs. Do not give what's holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine. Ask and it will be given to you. Enter the narrow gate. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And when Yahweh does a mighty work in your life, remember there is greater accountability. Be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Beware of men. When brought before governing authorities, don't worry about how or what to speak. Yahweh's Spirit will give you the words to speak. When evangelizing city to city, go to another city if you are being persecuted. Do not fear man, fear Yahweh. Never deny Yahshua or be ashamed of him or his words. Do not think Yahshua came to bring peace, rather a sword. Love Yahshua more than anyone else, even more than your own family members. Take up your stake and follow him. If you're labored and heavy laden, come to Yahshua and take his yoke upon you. Value peace and unity more than having your own way. And only make division where Yahweh makes division. Walk with Yahshua, otherwise you are against him. Gather with him where you will be scattered. There is no middle ground. And remember the danger of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which is unforgivable. And remember that we are justified or condemned by our own words. So, guard your heart. So we're going to continue in Matthew chapter 12, where we left off. It says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. But no sign, and no sign will be given to, given to it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, there are already plenty of signs and wonders that Yahshua did, accompanied by righteous teachings and a righteous example of Torah observance on Yahshua's part. And so, why were the scribes and Pharisees wanting to see a sign from him? We can be assured their motives were not pure. We see in Matthew chapter 16, they asked the same question. Verse 1 through 3, it says, And the scribes and Pharisees came... 
and testing them, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. So it had to do with testing him. It didn't have anything to do with really anything else. Trying to look for some way to accuse Yahshua and find fault with him. So he answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the, time, the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except it be for except the prophet Jonah, and he left them and departed. And so they were not seeking a sign because they wanted to see if he was a Messiah. They wanted to find some way to accuse him. That's their motive. Up to that point, he's already, already shown himself to be accusatory in nature, fault-finding, and based on an effort to try and discredit him. And so Yahshua told them they were part of an evil and adulterous generation. Their hearts were not loyal to Yahweh. That's why they were adulterous. They were loyal to man-pleasing. They were loyal to developing man-centered religions rather than Yahweh-centered relationship. And so Yahshua rejected their request to see a sign from him. It's not how Yahshua operated. Yahshua said that the generation only be left with one sign, and that's the sign of the prophet Jonah. He said, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Yahshua was in the grave three days and three nights, and in the same way Jonah was delivered from the belly of the great fish, Yahshua also was delivered from the grave. And it's true. The death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah Yahshua is indeed that one sign that has lasted down through the ages. It is the one sign that is still standing and has never gone away. Because really, I mean, Yahshua did many signs. John 12, 37, it says, For although he but although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. That the word of the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Yahweh who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed. And so problem was they didn't even believe the signs that were already there. But the one sign that still remains is an empty tomb. And in the first century, it was a very significant sign. The risen Yahshua actually was seen by over 500 witnesses. 1 Corinthians 5, or 15 verse 3 says, For I delivered to you first of all, that which I also received, the Messiah, Yash, the Messiah died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren. <clears throat> 500. Think about that. 500 brethren at once, of, the, of whom the greater part remained to, present, to the present, but some have fallen asleep. And so he's talking about witnesses, eyewitnesses that were still alive at the time he's writing this letter. Some of them had since died, but they were witnesses of the resurrection. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. And they were seen, seen by 500 men. It says, after that he was seen by James, then by the apostles, all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. And so, why is it? Why was it so evil for the scribes and Pharisees to ask for a sign? The fact was, they were asking it with the express purpose of discrediting. Yahshua knew that even if he gave them a sign, they still would not believe. And so, the command I actually see here, in Yahshua's words are the, as would be this. When you see the work of Yahweh, don't seek a sign in an accusatory way. I mean, there are other instances in Scripture where righteous men ask for a sign. In 2 Kings 20, verse 8, Hezekiah said to Isaiah, 
What is the sign that Yahweh will heal me and that I shall go up to the house of Yahweh the third day? And Isaiah said, This is a sign to you from Yahweh. Yahweh will, that Yahweh will do the thing which he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten degrees or go backward ten degrees? Hezekiah answered, It's an easy thing for the shadow to go down ten degrees. No, but let the shadow go backward ten degrees. So Isaiah the prophet cried out to Yahweh, and he brought the shadow ten degrees backward, by which it had gone down on the sundial of Ahaz. And so, now Hezekiah's motive was not accusatory in nature toward, toward Isaiah, uh, or in some effort to discredit him. And so in that case, there was nothing wrong to ask for a sign. But in the case of the hard-hearted Pharisees, the evil and adulterous generation of Pharisees there in the first century, who were resistant to hearing the truth because they wanted to continue in their evil ways, Yahshua told them this. He said, The men of Nineveh will rise up in a judgment with this generation and condemn it because they, repent, they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and indeed a greater than Solomon is is here. And so the issue with the scribes and Pharisees was not that they just needed to see a sign. No, they needed to repent. But they would not repent at the preaching of Yahshua. They would not humble themselves under the wisdom of his words. And so these other generations, these other men, and the Queen of the South <clears throat> will rise up on the Day of Judgment with that generation and condemn it. Now, Yahshua did many miracles in the first century. They clearly demonstrated Yahweh's power in him. John chapter 10, verse 37, he says, If I do not do the works of my Father, don't believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and believe the Father is in me and I in him. See, but they weren't interested in repentance. They weren't interested in humbling themselves under Yahshua's teachings, even though he did show the Father's works. And truth be told, all the healings and all the casting out of demons Yahshua did, he actually said next, he said, it's all going to be short-lived. And Matthew 12, in verse 40 says, 43, says, When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. Very interesting. <clears throat> very, very interesting. And so it was. Because even though Yahshua had done many mighty works, what happened there at the end? What happened? They're shouting, Crucify him. Crucify him. All the awesome and amazing and wonderful works that Yahweh had done through Yahshua in that time. And they're knee and they're shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And then the high priests, <clears throat> says they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. You see, that's how badly they wanted to get rid of him. That's how badly they wanted nothing to do with him or his righteous teachings. That in a stunning show of treason against Yahweh, they were even willing to say they had no king but Caesar. And so what Yahshua said would happen, did happen. And the last state, the last state of that generation was worse than the first. He said, so shall it also be 
with this wicked generation. They were worse off. After Yahshua had come and spoken to them, <clears throat> they were worse off than they were before. In fact, Yahshua said, If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my Father. Now, Yahshua's words can still very much apply in a man's personal life even today. I know of people, they, they do a lot of deliverance ministry. They spend a lot of time casting out of evil spirits with varying levels of success. But one thing I've noticed about the end result of their work is that a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times, the person does get temporary relief from the enemy. But their deliverance is not permanent. In fact, I would say that one of the reasons why some people are so tormented in the first place is because they, their heart really was not really yielded to the Father, and that's how they ended up in that, that condition. Now, I know that there are cases where some people do get delivered, and I don't want to discount that at all, but Yahshua's words are true. Unless your heart is truly repentant, and you fill up that empty space now, you've, you've, you've disposed of the enemy, and unless you fill up that empty space with Yahweh and his, his spirit and a love for him and a loyal heart that's committed to him, that unclean spirit's going to find its way right back in your life again. And this time, he'll bring other spirits even more wicked than himself, and the last day of that man will indeed be the wor worse off than the first. I can tell you a story uh, there was a fellow here in the county jail. He was involved in Wicca and all kinds of sorceries. And um, and I was ministered to him. And, and he was um, wanting to be delivered from this noise that was constantly in his head all the time. And I said, well, I'm going to give you a paper, and it has renunciations. And you're going to renounce all the former things that you were involved in. And now you are going to seek after Yahweh and you're going to believe the Messiah Yahshua and it will take the noise out of your head. He goes, okay. So I uh, gave him the paper and the next time I saw him, he said, you're right, it worked, it's gone. The noise is gone, I don't hear anything anymore. I can sleep at night. I said, okay, hallelujah, that's awesome. And then um, I couldn't come the following week and the week after that, I saw in the newspaper where he tried to kill himself. And um, he apparently cut his wrists and, you know, tried to kill himself. And he survived. And uh, when he came back to the jail, I talked to him. I said, what happened? He said, well, I, I went ahead and cast a spell after all that. And um, I don't know. All the noise came back. And I said, well... <laughs> And yeah, and your the last your last state was actually worse than it was before, because now you try to kill yourself, and uh, scripture talks about that. And um, you know the saddest thing about it was um, he never did change. He 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 just he wouldn't come back to Yahweh again, and um, and that really that was pretty tragic, but. Um, but we all have our choices. All of us have our choices. And uh, we have to make the right choice. And so what is the command here? If Yahweh delivers you from unclean spirits or the works of unclean spirits in your life, make sure you don't provide an open, empty house for it to come right back in. And I, in fact, I, I know um, of people who, um, they'll get delivered sometimes. They'll get delivered of their sin. In fact, Yahweh will take away their desire for that addiction that they were formerly addicted to. And even though he's take, taken away their desire for that addiction, or whatever they were addicted to, for some reason there are certain people that will just, 
They'll just go back and do it anyway. Even though they don't have a desire to do it anymore, they'll just do it on purpose. And that becomes a hook. It becomes a hook, and then they have to fight their way out of that sin. And so Yahweh blessed them with uh, taking away the desire for that sin, but then they went right back and just walked right back into it again, even though they weren't really being tempted to do it. They did it just to do, just to do it. And brothers, if don't ever, ever, ever do that. You're asking for those seven more wicked spirits, even more wicked than what you had before, to torment you. And I've had to counsel people in those kind of situations. And it's really, really tragic. So, all right, continuing here in Matthew chapter 12. And I'm going to go ahead and zoom this in a little bit here. It's like it's kind of zoomed out a bit too much. There we go. It says, while he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Now, what I'm getting from this is that Yahshua wants us to pay attention to the fact that once we repented and become a part of the body of the Messiah, we really have a new family now. And, and many of us who've come to understand the need to keep Yahweh's commandments in both the Old and New Testament scriptures, I think can relate to what Yahshua said. Because there's not too many of us out there. And, and while we do have our earthly family, and that's all well and good, but in many respects, unless that earthly family is also walking with us on this journey of faith and obedience, we don't really have that same family-like connection to them that we do to our spiritual family. And this faith that we believe really changes people. I, it just really, really changes people. I don't, I don't know of any other faith where you hear these stories all the time. People who have no fellowship in their area, and they're so hungry and so thirsty for fellowship, they will actually sell their house, quit their job, and move to a place where they can find fellowship. That's how much they long for their spiritual family. Now, to me, that speaks volumes as to the quality of a person's relationship with the Most High. And it really just shows how much they love Yahweh and how much they desire to be with his people. And it matches up very well to the mindset that Yahshua had here in Matthew 12, that we really feel that close connection to other people who are seeking to do the will of our Heavenly Father. And we see them as our, our, that close connection to that, that spiritual family. Whoever does the will of Elohim is my brother and my sister and my mother. In Luke 8, 21, he says, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of Elohim and do it. Now, some of us have lost family members over the faith. I have. And many times this will happen. That we will lose family members, but we also, Yahshua said, will gain family members. Yahshua answered and said in Mark 10, 29, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one Get what he said here. There is no one, no one, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold when? Now in this time. 
Now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands. But then he says, with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. That is such a significant statement. Such an amazing statement, really, that Yahshua said here. And there are some of us who have lost family members, and, and we have um, lost people that we loved over the faith. They hate us because of our faith. They don't want anything to do with us because of our faith. It's not that we're rejecting them. It's they are rejecting us. And so, and because they are rejecting us, um, then we feel like they're not really part of our family anymore. They just kind of went on their own way. And, um, and there are cases where the persecution is so bad, where you feel like you have to separate yourself. And uh, the day will probably come when the, the people that you would think loved you are ready to kill you. Or think they're doing Yahweh a service by having you killed. And so, what would be the command or the precept or the principle in this? Yahshua said, that basically, in so many words, value the spiritual family Yahweh has given you. And we 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 value that spiritual family because we are we both. We all have the same father. We, we really feel like there's this kinship. There's this connection that we have between us and other believers. And that's one of the things that make the feast so wonderful. And, um, you know, I know our Feast of Tabernacles this year was really, really special. Really felt uh, a close connection to a lot of people that were there. And uh, that was my spiritual family. You know, it's our, our spiritual family. And we love our spiritual family in Yahweh. And these are the people we're going to spend eternity with. You know, if we all stand firm and we all uh, remain faithful to the end, this is our permanent family, and we will spend eternity with uh, our brothers and sisters in the faith. And, uh, and so we rejoice in that. We rejoice in the times that we do have together. So... All right, so moving on here into Matthew chapter 13. It says, On the same day Yahshua went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places, where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they, may, they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear, and shall not understand. And seeing you will see, and not pursue, not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, 
Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly I say to you, that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Therefore, hear the parable of, a, of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. Now, we're going to stop here, and I want you to, to notice as we soak up the teachings here in Yahshua's parable um, that the word of Yahweh is ultimately at center stage. It is the focal point of the parable. Everything comes down to whether or not the word of Yahweh is going to germinate, take root, and bear fruit in a person's life. It's all about the word. And in this case, he specifically references the word of the kingdom. The word of the kingdom. The words of Yahweh. And as believers, we understand that the kingdoms of this world are lost. And they are following the ruler of this world, known as Satan, the devil. And the kingdoms of this world are going down. And anyone who is in hot pursuit of the carnal things of this life and is this world minded and this world focused will be on a fast paced journey to hell along with everyone else who are going down to the lake of fire. And those of us who have word, heard the word of another kingdom and consider the word of that kingdom to be good news, that the carnal wickedness of this age will come to an end and Yahshua will reign as king of that kingdom, a kingdom where the will of Yahweh will finally be done on earth as it is in heaven. And all sin and carnality will be punished. And we understand that kingdom and that word of the kingdom is the Torah. Because it says all throughout the scriptures and the prophecies, one new moon to another, one Sabbath to another, the whole world will keep the face of tabernacles, the whole world will come to Jerusalem and hear the Torah will hear the law of Yahweh. We understand the word of that kingdom is actually Yahweh's Torah. And we are blessed to know that. Blessed are our eyes to see that and our ears to hear that. The fact that we can understand the word of the kingdom is so, so important. Because if we don't understand it, the wicked one will come and snatch away that which was sown in the heart. Now, <clears throat> I'm not trying to say that those who are following traditional Christianity are all a bunch of lost people who don't understand the word of the kingdom. They understand that there is righteous righteousness that's going to rule and reign on the earth. They may not understand all the ins and outs of what righteousness really is, as Yahweh has revealed to us, but they do want righteousness, they do want love, they do want truth to reign. And so if that's what's in their heart, I don't judge them. But there are those who hear the word of the kingdom, but they're carnally minded, they don't understand it. They're either lacking understanding because of true ignorance, or because they don't really want to know. But either way, we don't want to be ignorant. We don't want to be among those who do not understand. We want to be among those who do.
do understand the word of the kingdom, and if we are repentant believers in Messiah Yeshua, then yes, we are among those who do understand. But I really don't think Yahshua's words only apply to the word of the kingdom. I think it applies to Yahweh's word in general. That unless we understand Yahweh's word, it's not really going to remain in our hearts in such a way it takes root and grows. But in order for us to understand it, we have to care enough to understand it. Again, if we want to understand Yahweh's word, we have to care enough to really understand his word. We have to love Yahweh enough. We have to hunger and thirst for righteousness enough that we want to understand, that we cry out for understanding and for wisdom. There are so many people who only read the Holy Scriptures, and when they read, there are many things they don't understand, but they don't stop and take the time to try to understand. And many are just content to do their daily duty and read some of the word and, and go about their normal business. And some will just rely on Bible teachers to tell them what the, what the Bible says or what Yahweh's word says or what it means, but they won't go and seek out the truth for themselves. And that can be a very dangerous way to live. There are many people doing this in traditional churches, and the seminary trained preachers are more than happy to explain the Bible to them along with the doctrines they have been taught in seminary. But because they don't understand it, and so the enemy really has no shortage of servants to take on that, uh, take that word of Yahweh out of their hearts and replace it with other things, replacement theology and other things that be move people away from obedience to Yahweh's commandments. But listen, life in the word is supposed to be about you having your own personal pursuit of righteous living and you having your own personal relationship with Yahweh and Yahweh teaching you and guiding you into the truth of his word by the power of his Holy Spirit. Now he can use a Bible teacher to help you do that. He did put teachers in the body of the Messiah but at the end of the day you are personally responsible to make sure that Bible teacher is speaking Yahweh's word rather than the doctrines of men or doctrines of whatever church denomination he happens to be promoting. And so concerning this seed that fell by the wayside, I could see the following command. When hearing Yahweh's word, seek to be those who truly, truly understand it. Very, very important for us to follow that principle. Very important. So moving on here to Matthew 13, 20. It says, But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but only endures for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. So when we actually do understand the word, it is important to recognize and be prepared for the fact that we will face tribulations and persecutions as a result of our choice to obey that word. In Acts 14.22 it says, We must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of Elohim. And if we are really sold out for Yahweh and we decide that we're going to be loyal to Yahweh at all costs, we will find ourselves being persecuted. And we live in too wicked of a world to not have any persecution, brothers and sisters. We just, it's just too wicked. And how we respond to being called a cult member or or a, a weirdo or a Jew or what all these things that they want to try to Sadly, they, they use the term Jew despairingly, disparagingly. But how we respond to that pressure, that, that societal pressure or the family pressure or the pressure from the people that were a part of the church we were attending at one time or how we respond to that pressure will ultimately determine whether or not Yahweh's word 
will bear fruit in us or not. And if we if we'll cave in and we're not willing to make a strong stand, then we will not survive. We will not bear fruit. If we're not willing to suffer in order to be obedient to our Father in heaven, or maybe we're just too embarrassed or too ashamed to really make a stand for him, then the word of Yahweh is just falling on the stony places in our hearts. And our hearts are not really good soil for Yahweh's word to grow. When the plants fall on stony ground, there's a little bit of soil there. And so they'll immediately they'll spring up, but there's not much depth to their soil. And so they don't retain much moisture. And since roots can't grow into rock, the plant is not going to have enough nutrients there to grow in the soil. And the sun's going to come out and dry up that soil, and they'll just wither away. As the wind comes and uh, may even get blown away. But that's what it's like for someone to receive the word of Yahweh, but the person is just what we call a, a good weather believer, a fair weather believer. All is well until it comes time to suffer as a result of the word. And then all their spiritual walk just kind of shrivels up like a prune. And so Yahshua admonished us in other places like Luke 14. Count the cost. Count the cost. He says, whoever does not bear his stake and come after me cannot be my disciples. That means you have a staros that Yahweh wants you to bear. Something that he wants you to give up. You have to die to self in order to give this up. And you gotta, he had his staros, which literally was a staros. But you've got your staros too that he wants you to bear something he wants you to give up for him. And so we got to bear that and come after him, or we can't be his disciples. He said, For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he's laid the foundation is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to, fit, began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, you must forsake all that you have. He cannot be my disciple. We have to make the decision that Yahweh is truly going to be number one in our lives. And we're going to take up our stake and we're going to follow Yahshua at all costs, even at the cost of our own life, our own pleasure, our own will, our own desire. Even Yahshua said, Father, if it's be your will, please let this cup pass from me. Right? Nevertheless, not my will. Your will be done. We have to make that decision that Yahweh is worth it. And to be in eternal relationship is truly worth whatever costs we may incur along the way. Even to the point where we're willing to lose our entire life if necessary in order to follow Yahshua, to obey Yahweh and be loyal to him. And so with this, I think we can gain the following principle and command. Be willing to obey and be loyal to Yahweh at all costs whenever persecutions and trials come. Now we see there are some who receive seed among thorns. It's he who hears the word and the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. So Yahshua here is speaking about thorns. Some that fell among thorns. So, very interesting, thorns were not a part of the original creation. 
they came later. And uh, and Yahweh said that they that the land was going to bear thorns. Um, and um, <clears throat> those who are allowing the word of Yahweh to fall among thorns uh, would be those who, actually the book of Luke says, um, the ones who are on, fell among thorns, those who have heard it go out and they're choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life. And that's Luke 8, 14. Cares, riches, pleasures of life. And so the thorns are symbolic of the world and or worldly people. And scripture says, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who's from Elohim, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by Elohim. If you really want to know the things that's been freely given to you by Yahweh. Do not entertain a spirit of the world. Do not entertain it. Do not give it any any place in your life. That kind of spirit is very active in the world today. It is an unclean spirit. And it is hostile to the ways of Elohim. And it wants to bring you into the pleasures of of the world, the pleasures of sin. And instead of love, it brings hatred toward Yahweh. Instead of peace, it brings us confusion. Instead of hope, it gives us hopelessness. And instead of righteousness, this unclean spirit gives us wickedness. And instead of a pure and undefiled love for Yahweh, it is at war with him. And it is a subtle spirit Every bit as subtle and crafty as a serpent in the Garden of Eden. And you may not know you're even listening to it, nor obeying its voice, because it's very subtle. And as believers, we have to understand, look, we're on a river. We're, we're on this raft, on this river, and in order to avoid going over the waterfall, where the current wants to take us, we have to turn this raft around and paddle against the current. We have to fight upstream. Because the world is trying to take us downstream. And Yahweh, however, is going to give us the ability to empower us to fight against that current. If we're willing to fight against it. And all you have to do to be going the wrong direction is just do nothing. Really. Really. You don't have to do anything other than that. Just do nothing. And you'll be going the wrong way. Don't fight. Don't keep don't fight to go up current. And guess what? You're gonna you're gonna go places you don't you don't want to go. And it's so easy to just rest and let the wrath kind of gently fill you down the stream. But that's not what Yahweh desires of us. Yahshua said, narrow is the gate. Narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few that find it. Few that find it. See, but the spirit that's in the world is trying to take you downstream and want you to give up that fight. And just relax and let it take you down the path. That does not bring life. And so we can choose, however, what to fill our minds with. The things that are of Yahweh's spirit and his goodness, or the things that are of the spirit of the world. And if we are filled with the things that are contrary to the spirit of Yahweh, we are listening to the spirit of the world. And we have to choose what spirit we listen to. Yahweh's spirit or that leads us down that difficult path, but it leads to eternal life, or the spirit of the world, that will take you on the broad and easy path. But the spirit of the world is very subtle, like a thorn plant that grows alongside the good plant. It just kind of entwines and entangles, and a plant that just destroys and slowly kills little by little, bit by bit until the word of Yahweh 
is choked out by its thorns. See, thorny plants tend to grow very quickly. Bramble bushes, they go up. You ever thrown a bramble bush in the fire? They also burn very quickly. I've heard it said if you put a frog in a, in a pot of boiling water, he'll try to jump out. But if you put a frog in a pot of water and just ever so slowly raise the temperature, he won't even know he's frying until he dies. And so it is with the spirit of the world, with this world and its pursuits at such a slow death that very few people know they're even being harmed by it until it's too late. It's such a deceptive death that few people know they're entering its doors and realizing to the extent in which they're falling into it. But it's especially difficult when we live in a world surrounded by thorn bushes everywhere. You know, Yahweh told Israel in Numbers 33, 55, he says, If you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, it shall be, it shall be that those whom you let remain shall be irritants in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they shall harass you in the land where you dwell. So we basically live in the very world that Yahweh was trying to prevent Israel from having to live in. A world full of influences to do evil. And nowadays, it's even worse because the influence of the world isn't just found in your next door neighbor, you know, or some guy on the other side of the street. The world now wants to teach you, teach your children its ways in their school where they can teach um, their theology and their worldview. The world wants to influence your hearts through mass media, through television and movies and books and magazines and smartphones and video tube sites and social media platforms. And there's so many avenues through which the world can influence our hearts and the hearts of our children to plant the seeds of disintegration, to plant the seeds that will that will cause thorn plants to grow in their hearts and choke out the word of Yahweh. We know it's going to get worse. And if we want to be his children, we have to reject those influences. We have to hate those lies. We have to hate that sin. And we have to love the truth and love righteousness. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 says, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception, unrighteous deception involves unrighteous things. Among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Why did they not receive this love of the truth? Because they had love for something else. It says, and for this reason, Elohim will send a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. What is the lie? The lie is, you will not surely die. It goes back to the Garden of Eden. You can practice sin and you will not surely die that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The real issue and the reason why they're deceived and the reason why they find themselves not having a love for the truth is because they have pleasure in unrighteousness. And so we see the wickedness in the world today. And we have to hate it. Does it mean we have to hate people? It means we have to hate the sin. And we have to love truth. And we have to love righteousness. It is so important that we love the truth. But you will not love the truth if you have pleasure in unrighteousness. If you have pleasure in sin and sinful things, you will not love the truth. Scripture says you will not be you will not receive from Yahweh that love of the truth. Because you have pleasure in unrighteousness. 
And you might think you're following truth. You might think you're doing great. But the reality is, Yahweh has sent you a strong delusion. So that you think you can continue in your sin and everything will be all right. And therefore you believe the lie. You will not surely die. Pure and undefiled religion before Elohim and the, father, and the fathers is to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted, unstained from the world. You've got to reject this world. How can we know whether we're following after the ways of the world? How can we know if we're walking in that spirit of the world? How can we know if that thorn plant is just up there? It doesn't necessarily mean our plant's not growing at all. It's just not bearing any fruit. How can we know? You know, maybe we keep certain commandments the world doesn't keep, and maybe we don't participate in some of the things the world chooses to participate in. But are there other ways in which we're receiving their spirit? Observe the world and what the world does and examine your own walk. Are you impressed by them and you find yourself doing what they do? You find yourself acting the way they do, looking the way they do, thinking the way they do. It's so easy to go along with the other sheep. There are thousands and thousands of sheep all headed the wrong direction. And they're all headed for going off a cliff. They think they're okay, though, because everyone else is going that way. We've got to be of another sheepfold. Turn the other direction and say, excuse me, I'm going a different way. I'm going to follow my master's voice. I want to hear his spirit, not the spirit of the world. It's so easy for carnal man to turn away and follow the other sheep. But we've got to hear the voice of the one shepherd. We've got to recognize his voice. And if we spend most of our time listening to that other voice, we're not going to recognize his voice. But if we spend our time listening to his voice, reading his word, when the stranger speaks, we're not going to recognize that as a shepherd's voice. But listen, it's always muddled and muddled between the voices of the world, the spirit of the world, and the holy things of Yahweh, and we think we can just walk in what you call the best of both worlds. You're going to, be, you're going to hear a bunch of noise. You're going to get confused. And you're in danger of following a strong delusion. Listen, it's not so easy for a carnal man to turn away from his carnal ways. And a lot of things in this world are very appealing to the flesh. In the background, you've got the father of lies constantly wanting to feed you with pasture after pasture of, and pleasure after pleasure and, and wants to justify everything. But we don't want that, brothers. We want the good pasture. We want the still waters. We want Yahweh to prepare a table before us, that word of Yahweh that we we're going to feed on. The grasslands, the tables, that's where we need to dwell, following that good shepherd. So that even though we may be in the midst of our enemies and the wolves, he will protect us if we're willing to follow his voice and stay in his sheepfold and don't go off somewhere else. You don't have to look and act like the world to win the world, brothers and sisters. You don't. I know they got a Christian version of almost everything, but listen, you don't win the world by imitating the world. You win the world by imitating Yahshua the Messiah. That's who we need to emulate. Who are we following? Who are we imitating? Are we imitating Yahshua or are we imitating the world who is following the father of lies and is inspired by his ways? What are we doing with our time? If there's ever any question as to whether something's worth your time, ask yourself, is this benefiting me spiritually? Ask yourself, can I picture Yahshua doing this with me and enjoying it? That usually cuts right to the chase. And we can often know the true character and values of a person just by observing how their time is spent. Let's consider, ask ourselves, how much time do we spend seeking and doing the things which do not give peace? How much time do we spend on worldly entertainments and things of this age that are temporal as, as opposed to things of the Spirit? What would Yahshua be doing in this age today? Sitting back and being amused with all the world's amusements all the time? Looking for something to be amused by? You know what the word amuse means? A is a negative particle, and muse means to think. No thinking. And I've heard it said, America's going to the lake of fire, and they're laughing all the way. 
Brothers and sisters, don't let the thorn plants grow up in your heart. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not totally against all forms of entertainment. I'm not saying it's all evil. I'm saying we need to be aware of the dangers here. Many people will read more about their so-called movie stars and sports teams and players and musicians and politicians than they'll read about Yahweh. And something isn't right about that. Scriptures collect dust while most people spiritually rot away in their easy chair, staring at their phones. Listen, the things of the Spirit need to be primary in our minds. The most important things in our lives have to be that which is spiritual. And when it comes to spiritual t things, we've got, we can't like put your spiritual hat on now, do the things of the Spirit, and then go off and do something else. Listen, Yahweh is always on the throne. He never steps down. And if you're a part-time believer seeking a full-time Elohim, you're in trouble. Yahweh's word says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of Elohim, what? Abides forever. I want to abide forever. This world's going down, brothers and sisters. It's going down. I don't want to go down with it. Do you want to go down with it? Adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know? Do you not know friendship with the world is enmity with Elohim? Who therefore wants to be a friend or a lover of the world makes himself an enemy of Elohim. Or do you think the spirit, scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? And so are we provoking the spirit of Yahweh within us to jealousy by the things that we do, by what we become entangled with? entertainments and things that don't profit. Yahweh says he's jealous of that time, brothers. He's jealous of our time. We've got to be redeeming the time. And we've got to recognize we're at war. It's not peacetime. We're at war. James 4, verse 6 says, Give more grace, therefore he resists the proud. And gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to Elohim, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to Elohim, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep, and let your laughter be turned into mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of Yahweh, and he will lift you up. And so if we have allowed ourselves to be subjected to the spirit of the world and we enjoyed it, and we allowed ourselves to be entangled with having affections for this world and the worldly things, we need to lament and mourn and weep and humble ourselves and submit to Elohim and resist the devil. Humble ourselves in the sight of Yahweh and yield our members to be members of righteousness and yield our hearts to be allowing Yahweh's word to grow in our hearts freely without competing influences that's going to suck out the nutrients in the soil and the water and, the, and block out the sunlight. And it's, it's not so much that the world sometimes it, it just destroys, totally destroys the plant. It allows the plant to continue to be there. Just the plant don't bear any fruit. plant doesn't bear any fruit, and that's the problem. So if there are things in your life that are just, if they're just hindering you from bearing fruit, if they're just taking the edge off your spiritual zeal, you don't need it. Get rid of it. It's the spirit of the world. And so the command I see here is don't get caught up in worldly things or pursuit of earthly riches. Worldly things would be desires for pleasure that war in your members. Anything that would be contrary to him. Anything. 
that would be contrary to him. <clears throat> Any spirit that is fundamentally at war with him. We need to have sensitivity to it and reject it in the name of Yahshua. It's simple as that. Now, there are some that receive seed on good ground. And that's the one that hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces. Now, some will produce hundredfold. Some will be 60. Others will be 30. But they're bearing fruit, and that's the most important thing. Now, what is the good ground? What is that good ground? Any farmer, any garden will tell you, good ground is well-prepared ground. Fertile ground. Now, compare those who would prepare their hearts to seek Yahweh versus those who did not prepare their hearts to seek Yahweh. We have to prepare our hearts, see. In Second Chronicles 12, 13, Rehoboam says he strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned. Now, Rehoboam was 41 years old and became king. He reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which Yahweh had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Naama, Ammonitus, and he did evil. Why? Because he did not prepare what? He did not prepare his heart to seek Yahweh. That's why. He didn't prepare his heart to seek Yahweh. He wasn't interested, really, in seeking Yahweh. And so his heart was not prepared to seek Yahweh. Now, Jehoshaphat, Yahweh said, Nevertheless, good things are found in you, in that you remove the wooden images from the land, and you, what? He says, you have prepared your heart to seek Elohim. Also, Ezra. Ezra says he had prepared his heart. Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of Yahweh and to do it. He wanted to do it. And to teach statutes and ordinances of Israel. In other words, he wanted to be among those who both do and teach the commandments. And thereby be great in the kingdom of Elohim. So, now, how can you prepare your heart to make sure your heart is the good soil for Yahweh's word to bear fruit in your life? Now, we know it can't be stony ground, right? You have to seek to understand it. It can't be... Um, sown among thorns, right? And it has to be ready to receive persecutions. So we prepare our hearts for those things. But we also, ultimately, what it comes down to is we have to make sure our hearts are completely yielded to the Father's will for our life. And we have to live our lives in full and complete surrender to his will. And if we understand the purpose of Yahweh's word, Every commandment has to do with one thing called love. It says, now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart. From a pure heart. And so this is a prepared heart right here. A heart that's pure. From a good conscience. From a sincere Faith, from which some have, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, and desiring to be like Ezra, this teacher of the law, but understanding neither what they say, nor the things which they affirm. They're speaking the law, but they don't understand really what it's saying. And they don't understand what they're even affirming. <clears throat> because they don't understand the purpose of the commandment is this. Love. From that pure heart, from that good conscience. And so every command has love as its aim. And that's where the scribes and Pharisees failed. They were like Ezra in one respect. They wanted to be teachers of the law, but they had not prepared their hearts properly. Their heart was loyal to men, not to Yahweh. And if we love Yahweh, we will want to listen to the things 
that challenge us so that we might change. The scribes and Pharisees did not want to hear when it came time for Yahshua to confront them about their sin. And John the Baptist confronting them about their sin. And I've heard it said the mark of a false teacher is he always tells you what you want to hear and never reigns in your parade. And the mark of a false believer is he never listens to those who do reign on their parade. And so we have to be people that want to change, that want to be challenged, that want to find things that bring us into a more loving walk with Yahweh. Now a prepared heart is willing to live as though Yahweh is always paying attention. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 23, he says, Am I not am I an Elohim near at hand? says Yahweh, and not an Elohim afar off. Can anyone hide himself in secret places so that I shall not see him? says Yahweh. Do I not fill heaven and earth? says Yahweh. And so a question for us to prepare our hearts is to ask Yahweh, how is he responding to our thought life? How is he responding to our thought life? Are our thoughts his delight? Or are our thoughts a burden to him? Do our thoughts cause rejoicing in heaven? Or do they grieve the spirit of Elohim? Is he grieving over our thoughts or is he rejoicing over them? From his throne, Yahweh knows your thoughts today in response to what you're hearing. He even knows why you're thinking why you think the things you think. He knows what you're thinking in response to what I'm saying right now. First Chronicles 28 verse 9 says, As for you, my son Solomon, know the Elohim of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and a willing, willing mind, with a willing mind. For Yahweh searches all hearts and understands all the intent, the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. If you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. So he not only knows what you're thinking, he knows why you're thinking what you're thinking. And so David is trying to say, look, Solomon, listen, Yahweh knows the imagination of your heart. And he knows if you forsake him in your heart. And he knows whether you're loyal to him in your heart. And we learn later the power of influence. His wives turned away his heart from Yahweh. And Yahweh desires that we love him with all of our hearts, not just part of our hearts. And aren't we supposed to love him with all of our heart? And so the thoughts and intents of our heart ought to be nothing but an expression of utter and complete love for him. Because he loves us that way. And if we love him with all of our hearts, then our thoughts will be one out of love and dedication and consecrated completely unto him. He deserves all of our hearts. He made it. He made our hearts, right? It's not good enough to give him part of it. He wants it all. And let's be sure. We do. We do confess our sins to him. We do seek his strength. We do seek his wisdom to overcome the things we're thinking that are not according to his will and that may grieve him. And so next time we enter into temptation, we need to remember, Yahweh is in observation, wanting to know what we're going to do. Are we going to reach for him? Are we going to fight against it? Are we going to continue to walk in it? Another thing, a prepared heart, is transparent to Yahweh about sin, striving to overcome. If we love him, we don't want to grieve him. And he is so ready to be our strength. If we call upon him and seek his face during those temptations, we need to be willing to look to him to be our strength during those times. And will we just be transparent to him and see open and honest with him about our struggles? Look, we've got to be because he already knows what we're thinking anyway. And whether we realize it or not. And so we don't want to fail to seek out his wisdom right? And his strength during those times of temptation. And don't be afraid to seek out more things for Yahweh uh, to convict you on. 
because look, he'll lead you at a pace you can handle. He'll, he'll lead you at a pace you can handle. Don't deceive yourself and pretend not to know something's wrong when down deep you know it is. Okay? He knows when you know, really, this isn't right. There's something you miss about this. Psalm 32 says, Blessed is he who trans, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom Yahweh does not impute iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. Now, what he's about to say here is him describing what it's like to have unconfessed sin. He says, When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. So then what happened was, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to Yahweh and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this cause, everyone who is righteous shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. And this is what happened to David, was David, he, he had this sin that was going on with Bathsheba, and it was just drying up his vitality like a drought. And so finally he was confronted about it. And then Yahweh, he, he, he truly did, he truly repented. And uh, he recognized his sin, and he confessed it, and he forsook it. Another sign of a prepared heart, a prepared heart is responsive to Yahweh's discipline. So we're, are we willing to confess our sins, specific sins that we are aware of but not dealing with? Are we willing to look to him to be our strength in times of temptation? Or are we going to act as though he's not around, like he's not the watcher of men, and think, well, Yahweh seeth not? Listen, you need to, when, when something negative is going on in your life, you need to look to him to see if he has something to teach you. Because here's what will happen. If you don't do that, then whatever negative thing is going on, a lot of times will just keep on going on. Until eventually, he um, gets our attention. And if he never does get our attention, we're in danger of completely backsliding and falling away. So we need to just listen to his discipline. If we feel like there's something negative going on in our lives, use it as an opportunity to do some self, self-reflection. Ask him, Yahweh, search, search my heart. See if there be some wicked thing in me. <clears throat> Reveal to me my own heart. Because we don't want to follow some other kingdom, Right? We don't. Yahweh has to come first. Will we choose to stray from him, or will we choose to love him? Will we choose another kingdom to follow after, or will we walk in the image he created us to walk in? Whose side are we really on? Our decisions ultimately tell the story of our life. And our decisions will tell the story of our life on Judgment Day and will ultimately determine our destiny. And all those little heart decisions, whether we're resistant to discipline or whether we're willing to walk in it and change whenever Yahweh corrects us, that is so important. Listen, your profession of faith does not mean you're saved. It's the style of life that you live after that profession. Whether you're, the style of your life is responsive <clears throat> to the will of the Father or not. 
Now a prepared heart allows Yahweh to be on the floor full time. It's because he's not a part time Elohim. He's not on the throne sometimes. He's always on the throne. And as I said earlier, if you're a part time believer trying to serve a full time Elohim, you are in trouble. Yahshua had a word for that called hypocrisy. And so ultimately, the most important thing is that we become doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And the important thing is not how much you think you know about him, it's whether he knows you. And a prepared heart has a love for the word and for the truth. Are we in hot pursuit of learning how to live our lives more pleasing to the Father? I'm burdened by the possibility that there are some here listening to the broadcast today to whom Yahshua would say, Depart from me, I never knew you. Because there's no passion for truth. There's no compassion for their fellow man. There's no growth in their spiritual walk due to a lack of interest. And they content, they're content, oh, I follow the feast, I do the Sabbath, I eat clean, I call on his name. Other than that, there's not really any desire to change anything else in their life because of false confidence, and they think they've picked the right religion, they got their ticket punched, and now they got their get-out-of-hell-free get card, and they're on their way. Listen, in a father-son relationship, the son's always supposed to be willing to hear what his father has to say at all times. The son doesn't just take a little bit of what his father said and say, well, if I just do what he told me to do five years ago, then I'll be all right. No, it's a continual walk, an active living faith, a faith that is aware of Yahweh's presence at all times as his father, willing to turn away from sin and seeks to do the little things and the big things that please him when no one else is looking. A faith that has a love for the Father's words and for the Father's wonderful ways of truth at all times, not just during service on Shabbat. A faith that is, when you're confronted with your own sin, you confess it and you resolve to forsake it. These are the marks of a heart that's prepared to receive that word. And the word of Yahweh will bear fruit in your life. And so as it says in Hosea 10, 12, sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. Be willing to allow the righteous word <clears throat> to be sown in your hearts. Then you will reap with Yahweh's mercy being upon you. But you must break up that fallow ground and allow the word, the seed, to enter in your heart, it is time, brothers and sisters, to seek Yahweh until he comes and rains righteousness on you. What a beautiful, beautiful scripture. Yahweh wants to rain righteousness on you. Your righteousness cannot come within your own self. He must cause that to fall upon you through Yahshua HaMashiach, through the Holy Spirit that comes down and, and rains on you and washes away all of your sin. What he wants, brothers and sisters, what he really wants is your heart. So break up the fallow ground, the hardened ground, and allow the word of Yahweh to enter in. Is there anyone in the sound of my voice who's not really prepared their heart to seek after Yahweh and to allow his word to bear fruit in their lives? You know, all the messages I share are meaningless unless you have broken up that fall ground and allowed these words to enter into your heart. Does your life honor Yahweh? Does Yahweh look upon you and see vast differences between you and the rest of the world. If you've not prepared your heart, there's still time. If you want to make a commitment, make a commitment wherever you are, at home, wherever, somewhere. But it's not just an altar call. 
where there's not much change that follows. And whether your heart is genuine is determined by where you are a month from now, a year from now. That's how we know. Whether Yahweh's word is truly bearing fruit in our lives. It's not the moment of commitment that proves anything. It's to change life afterward that demonstrates whether the heart was truly prepared to seek after Yahweh, the great and awesome and mighty Elohim, to follow his ways. Let's pray. Almighty Yahweh, name of Yahshua HaMashiach, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your word. Oh, Yahweh, we want your word to truly take root in our hearts. We want our soil to be well prepared, fertile soil for your word to grow, for our hearts to change, for our lives to change. We want to reap in mercy, Almighty Yahweh. We want to have that heart prepared with true love for you, for your word, and for truth, knowing you are on the throne at all times. We want to be responsible, responsible and responsive to your discipline. We want to be transparent to you about our sin. We want to strive to overcome. Because we know your eyes go to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for those whose heart is loyal to you. Oh, Yahweh, we want to be among those whose heart is truly loyal to you. Oh, great and mighty Elohim. Yahweh, strengthen us. Teach us your word. And most importantly, show us how to love the way you love, a faithful love, a love that's truly loyal with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our strength. Forgive us, Abba, in any areas we're failing in this, and open our hearts and open up our eyes to see any areas where we are not living up according to your perfect word. For we know yours is that perfect kingdom. Yours is the glory. And yours is the power and majesty. And all praise and honor and worship belongs to you. Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh our mighty one, forever and ever. Perfect us in your great love. In Yahshua's name we pray. Amen.